Well, uh, here, here's an outline of my talk. Uh, so first of all, um, there's some background, then I'll talk about symplectic rigidity and flexibility, um, which is kind of the main dichotomy in symplectic geometry, and that will uh, take up most of talk one. Um, and we might roll into talk two a little bit. And then I'll talk about uh, inverting primes in classical topology, inverting primes in symplectic topology, uh, and the constructions of the proof as a way to understand um, the, this dichotomy between flexibility and rigidity. Um, and that will be, that will be talked to. So, so that's the outline. You know, feel free to stop me at any point for questions or comments. Um, I might go too fast or too slow at some moment. So, so let me know if you want anything repeated. Okay, so let me begin with some background. Let me begin with uh, the, the usual motivation for symplectic geometry, which is classical mechanics. Classical mechanics, a state is just a point in the cotangent bundle because uh, trajectory is de determined by its position and momentum. And physical trajectories are those trajectories that satisfy Hamilton's equations where, I guess I should have write more than this, H is, it's called the Hamiltonian, it's some function from the cotangent bundle of M to R. Okay, so this is the Hamiltonian formulation of mechanics, which is a reformulation of Newtonian mechanics. But then the main insight of symbolic geometry is that there's a geometric insight, uh, geometric reformulation of this. Uh, so Hamilton's equations could be reformulated the following way, namely that there exists a two form on X, in this case, X is a cotangent bundle uh, of M, so that locally, this, this two form, which is omega, is of the form uh, dqi, which dpi. And um, then we have that the, uh, that Hamilton's equations have the following form. They are the gradient. So, so we have a path gamma and the derivative of gamma is a vector field uh, x sub h, where h is a function from x to r. And this x sub h is a vector field determined by the condition that um, when you contract it with the symplectic form, you get dh. So if you, if you follow this through, you, you see that you get Hamilton's equations. And the condition that this uh, form is as locally these coordinates implies that it's, it's closed and non-degenerate. So to sum this up, definition, we say that X is a symplectic manifold if it uh, comes equipped with a two form omega such that it's closed and non-degenerate. And then in the setting, you can do Hamiltonian mechanics. You can pick a function H from X to R and um, from that function cook up this X sub H in this way and, and then consider the trajectories and those will be these Hamiltonian trajectories. Okay, so that's the general setting. This is the definition of a symplectic manifold. And, and one key point is that if you start with this, uh, this geometric definition of being a closed and non-degenerate two-form, that actually implies that X is locally symplectomorphic to um, R2N with a standard symplectic form given by the sum of dQi, which dPi. So here I have coordinates QI and coordinates PI. So, so there's no local invariance in symplectic geometry. Um, but as, as we'll get to later, there are global invariants. So this is uh, somehow different from other types of geometry like Riemannian geometry where you have uh, curvature as a local invariance. Okay. 
So this is the main definition to remember, um, although we're not really gonna ever use it explicitly. Okay, so another important uh, object in symbolic geometry are isotropic submanifolds. And we say that submanifold is isotropic if this symplectic form vanishes on the submanifold. And by some linear algebra, symplectic linear algebra, this actually implies that the dimension of L is at most half the dimension of X. So I didn't say this, but X is always a even dimensional manifold if it's symplectic. And this is also just a linear algebra statement. And we say that it's Lagrangian if the submanifold is the maximal dimension it can be, which is that it's actually half the dimension of X. Okay, so I claim this is an important class of submanifolds. Let me give some examples. So first of all, the zero section in the cotangent bundle of M, namely all uh, points in M where the uh, momentum is zero is a Lagrangian, which you could check. Also the cotangent fiber at any point uh, Q, so here is Q, is just some point. And M is also a, a Lagrangian. So that's, you, you fix a position Q and then you're allowed to have any possible momentum, that's Lagrangian. So you, you can think at least based off these two examples that Lagrangians are um, and it's the possible starting states of a, um, of a system. And in fact, Lagrangians should be thought of uh, semi-classical states and they play a role in, in geometric quantization um, going from the classical theory to the quantum theory, but I, I won't go into that. But another motivating example for why to study Lagrangians is that if you take any symplectomorphism between M and N, then the graph of F is a Lagrangian in the product where you equip the first factor with, with the negative of its symplectic form and the second factor with the original symplectic form. So that's, that's also Lagrangian because of the negative sign. Okay. And I guess conversely, I should say that kind of any, any Lagrangian in, in this product, this is a, this is a correspondence it should be thought of as some kind of generalized symplectomorphism. So it should map Lagrangians in M morally to Lagrangians in M. And this doesn't always work. You need some transversality conditions, but um, just trying to highlight that you should think of Lagrangians in the product as giving you a map um, from N to N or the other way. Okay, any, any questions so far? Okay. okay, so let me say a few words about contact structures, which are the odd dimensional sibling of symplectic structures. So a contact structure is, so, so now you're in an odd dimensional manifold Y and it's given by the data of a one form alpha So the kernel is a distribution, and we say that this is a contact structure if alpha wedge uh, d alpha to the n is not equal to zero. And this is the condition that this, the distribution defined by alpha is maximally non-integrable because the condition that alpha wedge d alpha equals zero is the condition that is integrable. Here, we're saying alpha wedge d alpha to the n is non-zero. That's the, the opposite of that. And basically you should think of this distribution as kind of twisting uh, in the maximal possible way. Um, 
So it doesn't have any uh, very high dimensional leaves. So, so let's in fact talk about the leaves. Um, so we say that it's basically a leaf in the setting is uh, called, wait, what happened? Is, is called nisotropic. So that's just a submanifold of Y so that alpha vanishes on the submanifold. So this submanifold lambda will be tangent to the distribution. Um, oh, and I should also mention here that um, the dimension is at most um, the dimension of half of minus one, just like in the um, symplectic case where the dimension of the Lagrangians is at most half the dimension of the ambient manifold. Here, the dimension of these isotropics is at most half the dimension. And they're called, let me change colors. They're called uh, Legendrians if this is an equality. Then called Legendre. So the maximal uh, dimension uh, isotropics in the symplectic case are called Lagrangians. In the contact case, they're called Legendrians. Um, it took me many years before I could say this without mixing them up, but that's, that's what it is. Um, but those are somehow the most important objects. So that's why I wanted to actually um, state their names. Okay, so what's an example of a contact structure? Well, I mean, example is uh, R2n plus one given by the distribution uh, given by dz minus the sum of uh, yi dxi. And again, any contact structure actually locally has this form. This contact structure has what's called a front projection to its uh, x and z coordinates. And Z, here we have X, Y, and Z. There's one Z coordinate and there's uh, an X coordinates and X, Y coordinates. Um, so you just project to the X and Z coordinates. Okay, so why, why is this good? Well, okay, it's a good way because it, and it lets us study isotropics in kind of an easy way. Um, what's an example of an isotropic? Well, in this setting, if f is just any smooth function from Rn to R, then you could take the graph of f plus the graph of its partial derivatives in, um, in R2n plus one. And this is actually going to be a isotropic. In fact, it's gonna be a Legendrian because it has maximal dimension. And why is that? Well, it's because this condition that you're in uh, the, the distribution just says that uh, dz dx is equal to y, namely that y is given by the, the partial derivatives of the z coordinate with respect to x, and that's that's why you have this here. So um, if you have this condition, this is um, a isotropic in this contact manifold. So now in the front projection, you have the x and the z coordinates. So there you can draw the graph of just, uh, you can just draw the x and f of x. But more generally, you can draw, um, the, the front projection will, will be singular in general. And it might, it might look something like this, where um, there's two components that are smooth, but they meet at uh, points where the tangent planes agree. And the point is that even though this thing is singular, it has a well-defined uh, partial derivative. And if you, set the y coordinate to be the partial derivative and lift that to um, the x, y, and z coordinates, you actually get a smooth thing and it's isotropic. Um, so conversely, I could draw any, any kind of diagram like this where I have these cusps. And even though that looks singular in the front projection, it will actually lift to a smooth uh, Legendre. And the y coordinate will just be determined by the, the partial derivatives of the graph. Okay. 
Okay, so but basically this front projection is just a good way for us to get a handle on um, isotropics. Okay. So now let me talk about exact symplectic manifolds. So we say that a symplectic manifold is exact if the symplectic form is exact. So it has a primitive, which is a one form uh, lambda, and this is called the, the Louisville form. And then, you know, the simple application of Stokes theorem says that X either has boundary or is an open manifold. Um, mainly it's, it cannot be a closed manifold. Um, and when we have an exact structure like this, we can define the Louisville vector field, which I'll denote V sub lambda. And this vector field is defined by the condition that when you contract it with the symplectic form, you get back lambda. So this, this may seem like kind of a strange condition, but the geometric intuition is that this implies that when you at the lead derivative of omega with respect to this vector field is omega. So um, V lambda expands omega. And this expansion is the reason why you can't have a um, closed exact symplectic manifold. Okay. okay, so in the exact case, you have this expanding vector field. That's the point. So an example, we're already familiar with um, the cotangent bundle of M with the standard symplectic form, and there's a canonical uh, one form, which is the sum of uh, PI dQI, and its exterior derivative is a symplectic form. So it's, it makes it exact. And then we this implies that the Louisville vector field for this uh, one form is just radial expansion in, it's just the radial vector field in the, uh, the P coordinates. So the flow is just expansion in the P coordinates. And you can see that the symplectic uh, form grows as you move in the um, P coordinates. Okay. Now the connection to contact topology is the following. So it turns out that if V is transverse to the boundary of X, then uh, the boundary of X with uh, the distribution given by the, the kernel of lambda, where, where you restrict, so remember lambda is a one form on X, you can restrict that to the boundary of X. And this, uh, this gives a distribution on the boundary of X. This turns out to be a, a contact uh, structure if V was transverse to X. Okay, so that's that's one nice connection between symplectic and contact topology, which naturally arises in this exact setting. Okay, so now let me talk about Weinstein domain. So, so I'm slowly adding more and more structure, but um, it turns out that all of the structure will be, um, as usual, helpful to understanding symplectic manifolds. Um, so the, the idea for Weinstein manifolds is that you want to understand the symplectic topology of these exact manifolds in terms of the, the dynamics of their Louisville vector field. And uh, one of the simplest classes of dynamical systems is where the vector field is, um, is more small. So that's exactly what a Weinstein domain is. So okay, I guess I already wrote it. So you want to study the exact symplectic via the dynamics. And so we say that X uh, equipped with the symplectic form, the primitive and the function F is Weinstein. If F is a Morse function, so that just means it has non-degenerate critical points and V of lambda is gradient like for F. Okay. So, sorry, can you, can you repeat that? Um, there's an X and there's an M. 
Oh, that that should be. They should both be X's. I'm sorry. Yeah. Thank you. <clears throat> okay. So, so this this gives X a symplectic handle body decomposition as I'll describe in a second. So re recall from Morse theory that a Morse function gives a smooth handle body decomposition. But in this case, this, this Morse function is special. It's compatible with the symplectic structure in some way. So in fact, this handle body decomposition um, knows about the symplectic structure in some way. So let me move on to the, the diagram that I drew over here. So what's, what's going on here? Um, so just like in smooth Morse theory, we, we, we have a handle for each critical point of the Morse function. So we start with um, just a ball, which corresponds to a critical point of index zero. We increase the, kind of, we go past different level sets of the function. And each time we pass a critical point, the topology changes and uh, we attach a handle. And that's what happens here. But the handles are, are special because again, the Morse function is compatible with the symplectic form. Um, so how is it compatible? Well, first of all, the, um, the stable manifolds of each of the critical points, the, the cores are actually isotropic and the, the, their intersection with the, with the level sets are so the level sets are contact manifolds because the, the, the regular level sets will have uh, the Lua vector field transverse to them. And so that implies that the regular level sets are actually contact manifolds. And the attaching spheres for the critical points, like where the stable manifolds intersect these level sets are also isotropic. And so, so in particular, since everything is isotropic, the critical points have index at most n. And one thing you can do, it turns out, is you can first attach the handles of index less than n, which are called subcritical, and then attach the handles of index n. And the important thing about the handles of index n, which are called critical handles, is that their co-cores or their unstable manifolds are actually Lagrangian as well. Um, and their boundary maps to the boundary. So that will be something that's, uh, that will come up later. I wanted to mention that. But, so, yeah. and in general, the, the co cores are like, I guess, co isotropic or something? That's right. Okay. <clears throat> All right. And the, here I'm using the fact that the critical co cores, the critical handles are attached last um, so that the boundary of the co core maps to the boundary of X. That's also going to be important. Anyway, so you start with a ball. You you find some. Uh, you can also do this constructively. You can also start with a ball. You can find some isotropic spheres in your contact manifold. Attach a handle. Get a new domain with contact boundary. Find another isotropic sphere in there. Attach a handle and keep going. You can also use that to construct a one sheet domain. Okay, so that's that's what this is. So observe that this means that any Weinstein domain X is actually homotopy equivalent to an n-dimensional CW complex because it admits a Morse function, all of whose critical points have index most n. And the union of the stable manifold, so, and the whole thing, the whole thing retracts to the union of the stable manifolds, which is a, which is this n-dimensional CW complex I mentioned. And this is a singular, Lagrangian, it's called the skeleton of the domain because the, the whole the whole, uh, whole domain manifold retracts to the skeleton. So basically you should think of a uh, Weinstein domain, Weinstein manifold as um, kind of a, sing a cotangent bundle of a singular manifold. There, was there a question? Yes, uh, can you hear me? So, sorry, can you turn your volume up or maybe I should do something? Can you hear me now? Or is it... Yeah. yeah okay. um, so how, um, 
special is it to have this criterion that it is a Weinstein manifold? So can I turn every symplectic manifold into a Weinstein manifold? Because you wanted this gradient uh, vector field to be, uh, sorry, you wanted the vector field to be gradient-like, right? Uh, is yeah. Is a strong, a strong property here or is it? Uh... Yeah, it's pretty strong. I mean, first of all, it means that the manifold is homotopy equivalent to something half the dimension. Okay. Which is which is not even for exact symplectic manifolds. This is not true. All right. Yeah. So it's a yeah, it's a pretty strong condition. But this is kind of most of our examples are actually of of exact symplectic manifolds actually have this form. Okay. Um, and there's a pretty large collection of them. Thanks. Yeah. So let me let me give some examples. Maybe that will clarify. Um, so first of all, you could you can take any smooth Morse function on M. I guess I wrote this Morse function as F tilde because it's a Morse function on M, and that actually induces a Weinstein structure on a cotangent bundle of M with the standard symplectic form, with the same critical points as F tilde um, lying on the zero section. Um, you, you have to modify the exact structure I, I gave before a little bit, but um, it's it's not a very difficult modification. Um, I mean, basically, if you have a smooth Morse function on M, you get a handle smooth handle smooth handle body decomposition of M, and if you kind of thicken it, kind of cotangent bundleify that decomposition, you get a decomposition of cotangent bundle of M. So, so here's an example um, for T star SN. So SN has a Morse function with two critical points, a zero and N uh, critical points. And claiming the cotangent bundle of T star SN has also a decomposition with a single zero critical point and a single index N critical point. And the zero critical point corresponds to a ball with the standard symplectic structure. The, the boundary is what's called the standard context sphere. And so you just, to, to figure out what this y structure is, you just have to know what the attaching um, uh, isotropic sphere is. And it turns out to be precisely this uh, isotropic sphere, which I drew before. So here I've drawn it again in its front projection in the contact manifold. Um, uh, this uh, S two n minus one, um, where which locally has the form uh, R two n minus one, the standard bundle structure, and um, to construct uh, this cotangent bundle, you just attach one of these handles to that, and then it makes sense to ask, well, what is the what is the cocore of this index n handle? And it turns out the cocore is the cotangent fiber at this critical point Q, um, which we already know is a Lagrangian. And it's a disk. So this is uh, the main example of a Weinstein structure you should have in mind. Does this picture make sense? Okay. And another class of Weinstein domains come from affine varieties. So an affine variety of dimension 2n inside some uh, uh, inside c to the 2, uh, I guess, capital N, actually has a Weinstein structure with the symplectic form given by the restriction of the symplectic form. And by what I mentioned before, this implies that the homotopy type of x is at most uh, n-dimensional, so it's at most half the dimension of x. And this is precisely the classical Androidi frankel theorem. Um, the uh, discussion I had before it was kind of a symplectic way of proving this Androidi frankel theorem. So I wanted to mention that connection as well. And finally, there's, there's a way of actually changing um, these Weinstein 
manifolds that does not change the ambient symplectic structure. Um, and these are called handle moves and they're completely analogous to handle moves in smooth topology. So you can cancel two handles if the attaching sphere kind of intersects the um, what's called the, the belt sphere of the lower index handle at exactly one point. And you, you can also create handles going the other way. And you can do a handle slide where you have two handles of the same index and one kind of engulfs the other. And the main thing here is that even though you have the same number of handles, the, the attaching spheres in the contact manifold change drastically. So even though the attaching spheres are not even smoothly isotopic in general after you do a handle slide, the, the domains will be the same. So the, the point is you, you start with a single presentation of your Weinstein domain, but then you can do all these moves which don't change the symplectic structure. Um, and so you should really consider Weinstein domains up to these handle moves. Um, it's the natural pressure of the coolants in the setting. Okay. Okay, so, so now I wanna change gears a bit. Um, so let me talk about symplectic rigidity. So there's, there's a natural forgetful map um, from symplectic manifolds to smooth manifolds, uh, possibly you could consider them equipped with a non-degenerate two form, where the, the right hand side is kind of completely classical data, something we can study with just smooth topology, because a non-degenerate two form, that's some bundle theoretic data. Um, whereas the left-hand side is, you know, generally uh, symplectic information. And then a natural question you could ask is, well, is this map on, on spaces, on the space of symplectic manifolds or smooth manifolds, if you want, uh, injective on uh, pi zero? Um, or even say the higher homotopy groups. And what I mean by rigidity, symplectic rigidity is circumstances where you have either non-injectivity or non-surjectivity. This map fails to be an isomorphism. So it's, it's a phenomenon where symplectic geometry is, is different from smooth topology. Either you have um, two symplectic manifolds which are the same as smooth manifold but different a symplectic manifold, or maybe you have um, a smooth manifold with a non-degenerate two form, which actually does not have a symplectic structure. And um, so, so that's that's what rigidity will, will essentially mean: some kind of uh, uh, kind of difference between symplectic and smooth topology. Okay. So, in this setting, let me mention a theorem of Mark McLean, building on work of uh, Seidel and Smith, that's that's relevant in um, in our setting. Of course, there were many other examples of symplectic rigidity before this, um, but this is the one that's most relevant for us. So their result says that if n is at least four, there exist infinitely many Weinstein uh, manifolds, which I'll denote sigma sub k. Of dimension two n, which are all diffeomorphic to the ball, but they're pairwise non-symplectomorphic. So, um, in fact, you, you can't. So that implies they're not a Weinstein homotopic. In the sense that you can't use these different moves to get to one to the other, but they're also not symplectomorphic. Okay, so this is an example where this map is not injective on pi zero. And the key idea, which I should probably mention, is, is due to Gromov, which, which comes much earlier than this paper, and it's to use j holomorphic curves. I just want to sketch, just say a few words about uh, what, what goes into this, because this is a completely uh, different idea than uh, I think people had encountered before. And the idea is to pick a almost complex structure j which is compatible with the um, symplectic form in some way. I'm not gonna say exactly what that is. And then to consider uh, maps which are holomorphic with respect to this uh, capital J on X from a Riemann surface 
into X and to consider the moduli space of these and to use the, the basically to use the fact that J is compatible with the symplectic form to get compactness of this moduli space. Um, so yeah, so these J holomorphic curves are like in, in some way, like the main source of symplectic rigidity that we have. Now we have sheaf theoretic uh, ways of getting rigidity, um, but anything that can be proven using these sheaf theoretic methods could also be proven using J holomorphic curves. Okay, so that's the underlying uh, ingredient in all of this. And I won't say much more because um, we're not gonna be really dealing with J holomorphic curves. Um, Directly, the the main thing I want to talk about, which which comes from J holomorphic curves, and uh, was actually used to distinguish these uh, these sigma sub k's, is what's called the um, the Rav Fukai category. And even though it's it's an algebraic uh, object, it still has a fairly um, geometric description. So. So the objects, so, so X is a Weinstein domain. In this case, it could be an exact symplectic manifold. The objects are exact Lagrangians. So by an exact Lagrangian, I mean, um, let, me, let me see. So by an exact Lagrangian, I mean that we have this little form lambda and lambda restricted to L is zero, or sorry, it's not zero, it's, it's exact. So it's exact Lagrangians in X and the Lagrangians can either be closed or have boundary, but their boundary has to map to the boundary of X if they have boundary. Um, and, and in fact, near their boundary, the, the form has to vanish in fact, not just be exact. Okay, so those are the objects. The morphism spaces between two Lagrangians L and K are work what's called wrapped floor co-chain. So it's actually, the morphism space is actually a, a chain complex. This chain complex is generated by intersection points between L and uh, K, if they intersect transversely at least. And there's a differential, which is this floor differential. And this differential counts um, J holomorphic curves between um, kind of two intersection points, P and Q, whose boundaries are on L and K. So, so objects are, I guess, fairly simple, but morphisms are already like pretty complicated. Um, so that's what the Rav Fukai category is. And usually this category is like too hard to compute. And in fact, we don't really have any computations of it as stated. What people usually consider is an algebraic enlargement of the Fukai category, which is to consider twisted complexes on the Fukai category um, or, or modules over the Fukai category. And then to study that, and we actually have many computations of this enlargement. Um, okay, so let me give an example of, to give a flavor of this twisted complex business. So, so let's see, so suppose you have P which is uh, a morphism from L to K. And so, so this is just, suppose this is just a single intersection point um, between L and K. Then you can do surgery on this intersection point to create a new Lagrangian um, L. So I'll denote like this L uh, surgered K along P. So this is a new object in the Rap Fukai category. And then the claim is that the surger Lagrangian is actually isomorphic to the cone from L to K along the morphism P in, in the Rav Fukai category. So, so for any morphism, you could take the cone in this twisted complex business. So the, the mapping cone is considered a twisted complex. And what I'm saying is that this, this algebraic mapping cone actually is isomorphic to a completely geometric uh, construction, which is to do surgery. So that's how you should think of these twisted complexes, basically as some kind of way of doing surgery. Um, although 
practice set only holds in restricted settings like this where they intersect at a single point. Okay. Just do people have questions. Okay. Uh, maybe a question, Oleg. Yeah. So, like in this, yeah. So in this twisted complexes, uh, so are like all objects there sort of iterated cones or something like this, or how many more things are there? Yeah, that's that's right. Yeah, they're all they're all iterated cones. Fair enough. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So why why is uh, considering this algebraic enlargement helpful? Well, there's a theorem of um, two groups of people um, that I've written here uh, that says that if X is Weinstein, then the Lagrangian co-cores CI, which which are objects of the Rapkai category because they are Lagrangians with boundary um, in the boundary of X. Of index, so those co-cores, the co-cores of this uh, index n handles, they actually generate these twisted complexes. So, so any Lagrangian is actually an iterated cone on these co-cores, and um, morally, this is saying that any Lagrangian can be obtained by surgery on the co-cores. Um, of course, this this can't literally be true because the co cores have boundary, whereas, and if you do surgery on them, you're always going to get a thing with boundary. Um, remember, this is up to isomorphism, the Rapukai category. And um, it turns out that it, it is true. Um, so, so I guess what I'm trying to highlight is that there are Lagrangians which are closed, and those closed Lagrangians you definitely will not be able to obtain by doing surgery on the co cores. Uh, nonetheless, they are isomorphic to something that comes from surgery. Yeah, maybe I don't understand. What does isomorphic mean in the setting? What, what should we think? Well, there's, remember, okay, the, the morphism spaces uh, involve wrap floor homology. Right. Um, so it's, it's going to be some morphism so when you compose okay so for example two things will be if two things are isomorphic then they have the same uh wrapped floor homology with themselves at least that that's a minimum requirement and there are lagrangians which have the same uh yeah i mean they have lagrangians with different topology which have um the same wrapped uh, floor homology and are isomorphic. Okay, just a simple statement. Like, for example, in the standard ball, there are no there are no closed Lagrangians, and there are Lagrangians with boundary, but each of them are actually isomorphic to the zero object. They all have zero wrap floor homology. Um, I don't know if that was helpful. Basically, like no, isomorphic it is helpful, yeah. something to do with wrap wrap, wrap floor homology. I mean, maybe maybe my more precise question would be: so, let's say, if you have two Lagrangians and their morphisms with respect to any other Lagrangian are kind of isomorphic, so like, yeah, their morphism spaces yeah. is is would that be? I mean, that's necessary, but that is yeah. not sufficient for isomorphism, or, or or is it? I mean, I think if that's done in in some kind of functorial way, that that is sufficient. Okay, the, so it's some sort of the, algebraic the unit, by the unit lemma. Ah, okay, okay, so that really is what you, okay, okay, then I think I understand. Okay, yeah, thanks. Yeah. Maybe also another question. So these co cores are all disjoint, right? So on the nose, you cannot really do surgery with them because, well, basically, you need intersection points for them. But if you apply like simple symplectomorphism to one of them, they might intersect the other. And then you do a surgery, and that's how you generate them. Is that is that sort of? That's right. That's right. Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah. You yeah you kind of like flow one to the other, and that that flow um, preserves the isomorphism class, and then they intersect and do surgery. 
Yeah, so I, I guess I guess I kind of lied a little bit like up here when I said that it was uh, generated by the intersection point of L and K. It's it's really um, the intersection points of um, kind kind of a infinite wrapping of L and K. Like if if this is if this is L, if, sorry. It's just to wrap this many times to create this phi one of L. So yeah, so so even in the definition of the morphism spaces, you're supposed to apply some symplectic morphism first, and then you will have intersection points. And this the symplectic morphism looks like you're wrapping an infinity, and so that's why it's called wrapped Fukai category, as opposed to the usual Fukai category where you um, you don't have to apply this morphism, um, um, yeah, unless you have to ensure transversality, um, but that's that's right. Maybe, maybe, then maybe I have a stupid question. Why do we wrap? Like if you do the same definition, but without wrapping, then what happens? So, so then you, it will not be invariant under isotopies through Lagrangians with boundary. So, so if you don't wrap, I mean, right. the, wrapping is, the wrapping is only for Lagrangians with boundary. So that's the main new ingredient in this, in this setting. Um, and if you don't wrap, then your fluoromology is just not going to be invariant under these non-compactly supported um, isotopies. Yeah. Thanks, Alec. OK. Okay, so here, here's here's an example uh, uh, computation. So let's go back to the cotangent bundle. Recall that the cotangent fiber is the only index cocore for the presentation that I gave, and this implies that twisted complexes on the Fukai category is actually isomorphic to um, twisted complexes on just that fiber, and that's just determined by uh, endomorphisms from the fiber to itself. And then Abu Zaid computed that the wrapped fluoromology between the fiber and itself is equal to um, chains on the base loop space. And so the whole thing is, is essentially some kind of modules over chains over the base loop space, which are derived local systems on M. So um, the, yeah, the, the point is that once, once, you, once you enlarge the twisted complexes, you have this generation result and then you just have to compute the wrapped fluoromology between say like one Lagrangian in itself. And so it reduces to more finite problem and you're done. And another thing I wanted to mention is that going back to these exotic balls, these sigma uh, K and sigma L, they are, they actually have different Fukai categories. And so that's what shows that um, they're not symplectomorphic, as I mentioned before. Remember, these are balls that are all, so they're all diffeomorphic to the ball, but they're, they're pairwise non symplectomorphic. Okay. So, so that's, that's it for, for rigidity. Okay, now I want to switch over the discussion of symplectic flexibility. So rigidity was all about um, situations where symplectic and smooth topology are, are different. Um, now flexibility will be the opposite in situations where um, like the smooth structure maybe plus some other tangential data on a symplectic manifold actually determines the symplectic manifold. Um, so that's kind of saying there's not, in those situations there's not much symplectic geometry, it's all smooth topology that determines symplectic geometry. So let me give some examples. Um, so we say that a Weinstein domain X is subcritical if all handles have index at most N, or sorry, sorry, index strictly less than N. Remember, the handles have index at most N, but in the subcritical case, the handles have index strictly less than N. And Gromov proved the following results, which is known as an H principle which says that if you have X and X prime, one two domains, which are subcritical, then if they are diffeomorphic, then 
they are actually symplectomorphic. So this is you know, a canonical flexibility result. The smooth topology determines the symplectic topology. Um, okay, so what does this mean in our setting? Uh, so let's go back to these exotic Weinstein balls, sigma k and sigma l, which are not symplectomorphic. However, if you cross them with C, then they actually do become symplectomorphic because um, when you cross the, the manifold with C, its dimension goes up, but the index of the critical points does not change. So remember all the, so, so, so basically compared to the dimension, the, the index of the critical points now um, is, strict, is now strictly less than half the dimension after crossing with C. So, so sigma uh, cross C will be subcritical and they're still diffeomorphic. So by Gromov's H principle, well, they actually are symplectomorphic. Um, and I guess I also want to mention that for any subcritical Weinstein manifold, the Rapfukai category is zero. And this is, I mean, one way to prove this, maybe a very high level way to prove this is because there's no index and handles. So there's no generators at all. So the Rapfukai category in this case is trivial. Okay. And let me mention, th there's another class um, of wine sheet domains, which are called flexible. And, and these are when the isotropic attaching spheres of the index and handles have loose charge. So in the subcritical case, you had no index and handles. In the flexible case, you do have index and handles, but they're required to have special attaching spheres, which have loose charts, which is what, which is kind of a zigzag in the front projection. So, so what do I mean by that? So let's recall the case of cotangent bundle. Now the standard cotangent bundle uh, has a presentation like this on the left. Now the flexible one will have a presentation where you, you just add in a zigzag in its front projection. So this operation does not change the smooth topology, but it actually does change the symplectic topology because well, the Fukai category of the standard cotangent bundle is, is non-zero, this is, this is non-zero, but it turns out that the Fukai category of this flexible cotangent bundle, it is zero. So once you add this little zigzag, you're not changing the knot type smoothly, but you are changing it as an isotropic knot and uh, that just changes all the symplectic structure. Okay. And there's an H principle for these as well due to Chilibag and Eliashberg building off of some work of Murphy, which says that if X and X prime are flexible, oh, and I should, this is an important point to make, this flexible condition, in a, you need N at least three. And um, they are diffeomorphic, then they're actually symplectomorphic. So again, the smooth topology determines the symplectic topology. Um, Okay, and when I say diffeomorphic, I really mean you need a little bit more tangential data, but it's uh, it's bundle theoretic. It's not it's uh, it's not it's not geometric. So, but this is the statement you should have in mind. So just a little bit of a white line. Okay, so what this implies is that if you flexibilize the sigma k, it actually is symplectomorphic to the flexibilization of sigma L. And, but you're not changing the smooth topology. So unlike in the subcritical case where you have to multiply by C, in this case, you don't have to multiply by C. You just have to add a bunch of zigzags to all your index and handles, and then, and then you're good. And you might be wondering, well, why, why is zigzag? And it turns out that like really what you wanna be doing, I mean, the, the thing that distinguishes symplectic and smooth topology is that you might have two isotropics which are smoothly isotopic, but they are not isotopic through isotropics. And so what you wanna do to prove that two things are symplectomorphic is to approximate a smooth isotopy by a uh, you know, and isotopy through isotropics. So if, if you think about what that means, it reduces to the following um, statement, which is that any function 
can be approximated with the graph of any function can be approximated by an isotropic front with arbitrarily small slope. So here I've drawn this function this z equals x and uh, well it has slope one but instead I'm gonna approximate it by this this uh, Legendrian which has a bunch of zigzags and the, because of those zigzags its slope is it's arbitrarily small um, and it lives close to the the corresponding the genre in, uh, given by the graph of y equals x. Um, so, so that's kind of the main reason that zigzags appear. And this is th this is kind of a germ of the, uh, the the proof for this h principle. This is the main idea. Okay. And um, let me let me state uh, a result I proved several years ago, which is that um, if n is at least three, then in fact any Weinstein domain can be decomposed as a flexible one plus plus two Weinstein handles. So I start with the Weinstein domain and I do a bunch of handle moves to it and I get a flexible thing plus just two handles. Now this flexible thing, it is smoothly trivial as trivial Fukai category, but it has all, it, it's diffeomorphic to X. So it's smoothly non-trivial. Now these two extra handles, in fact, they are, they're smoothly canceling. So it's, it's a smooth, co smooth concordance. And uh, so it's smoothly trivial, but in fact, that's where all the symplectic topology uh, gets transferred into because um, well, this about to the data has to go somewhere and it can't go into the flexible piece because that has no information. So in fact, it goes into data of these two handles. So you get this type of decomposition of an arbitrary symplectic manifold. Sorry, of arbitrary Weinstein domain into uh, a flexible piece plus this smoothly trivial piece that has all the symplectic structure. And let me just roughly say what the idea is. Um, suppose, suppose I have uh, two, I want you to make it with two handles. So, so here I have, I have these two handles and those are the attaching spheres. And I can do a handle slide. I, I didn't say exactly what the model for a handle slide is, but I've, I've drawn the result in this case. And when I do a handle slide, and I have to do it in a special way, um, in this case, it, you don't really have to do anything. You see that a loose chart appears. You have this zigzag um, th that appears and if you first attach to that sphere, you get a flexible domain. And then this, this is the other, when you attach to this handle, this is, um, so, you, so, so you attach this one first, and then you attach this one second. And the first one you, you attach, you very flexible domain because it has this loose chart, and then you attach the second one, um, and then you have an extra handle. Anyway, the, so, so this is just kind of a very, very rough sketch of the proof the ideas, do handle slides and then these loose charts appear and uh, you get this decomposition. So this is, I wanna say this is, I, I would call this some kind of symplectic age cobordism theorem for the following reason, because it implies that, it implies the following inequality. So, so something you can do, you can start with the Weinstein presentation, you can, which has some number of handles then you could ask, what is the minimum number of handles I can get if I uh, am allowed to do these handle moves? Remember, I can like create handles, I can cancel handles, um, and then I can do all these handle sides. What is the minimum number of handles I can I can get? Well, the minimum number of Weinstein handles is definitely uh, at most the minimum number of smooth handles. But this result up here shows that in fact, the minimum number of Weinstein handles is at most the minimal number of smooth handles plus two. Um, so this is this result that I gave before. Could you, because basically for a flexible domain, the minimum number of Weinstein handles is equal to the minimum number of smooth handles by the H principle. But then you need two more handles kind of coming from these the smoothly trivial cobordism. And 
So, and let me, let me say that this result is actually sharp. There are examples where the minimum number of YNG handles, you need um, two more than you need smoothly. Um, and the minimum number of smooth handles by Smale's h cobordism theorem, um, if you're simply connected, is at most the rank of singular homology plus two. So, and this applies to any YNG domain. It doesn't have to be flexible, but you are using flexibility as part of the proof. So that's kind of saying that even though you have a special class of flexible domains, they're creeping into the world of all uh, YHD manifold. They're not, they're not completely isolated. Um, and what this implies is that you get a bound on the number of generators of the Fukai category. Remember the number, the Fukai category is generated by the co-cores of the index and handles. And in principle, you might have many, many more uh, index and handles than you, you would smoothly, but by this theorem I just stated, you can do a bunch of moves to uh, cancel most of the handles and get to um, as many handles as the rank of the singular homology plus two. And so that implies that the number of generators of the rap category is at most the rank of the singular homology um, plus two. In fact, it's 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 the rank of the sing it's the maximum of the rank of the singular homology, um, or or one. Um, so it's it's a little bit better. But but the the takeaway I want to uh, give is that flexibility has even creeped into this rigid world of the Fukai category. Like it's affecting things like how many generators the Fukai category has. Um, and the overall question I wanna end with is what, what is the relationship between flexibility and rigidity? What, what, it, what is between flexibility and rigidity? Because on the one hand, you have the special class of flexible domains, which have trivial Fukai category. They have this H principle. On the other hand, you have general Weinstein domains, which have uh, sometimes pretty crazy rap Fukai categories. They know things about, um, like in the cotangent bundle case, they know things about um, the diffeomorphism class of the zero section. And it just seems like there's kind of a complete two distinct classes. Is there a way to go like from one to the other, triplet between one to the other? And so this is what I'm gonna talk about in, in part two. So let me, let me stop here.